I'm Isha Roy, and I'm here at 2011 Salta Festival. I'm here with best-selling author, an expert on leadership, women, and di diversity in the business world, Nina Goriwala. Nina, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Great to be here. So tell us how you got involved with SALTAF and what are some of the key topics that you would like to bring about on, in your, during your session later on today? Well, um, my interest in SALTAF is uh, my book, one of the main themes in the book is about my experience as growing up as an Indian American, as a second generation, and really trying to go after the American dream like so many of our parents, so many of our parents have come here for us to do. And one of the, the main topics that I talk about, uh, my book's about my experience on Wall Street, and the environment on Wall Street, the corporate culture, was not a very self-aware culture. It wasn't one very open to people with differences. So one of the main topics I do hope to discuss today is how we can work on making corporate cultures, organization cultures, more welcoming to people that, have, that are different. So you're the best-selling author of Suits, A Woman on Wall Street. And it's, like you said, it's a memoir of your two years as a junior analyst with Morgan Stanley on Wall Street. Uh, for those who haven't read the book yet, uh, and I guess you'll be speaking about it during your session later on today, tell us a little bit about your experience as a woman, a minority, and someone not necessarily coming from a privileged background, um, and how you dealt with this uh, really male-dominated work culture. It was the kind of environment, I, I describe it very quickly, as a, is leave your identity at the door. There are a lot of people, they try and bring in minorities, they try and bring in women, but the attitude there is you need to conform to be like us, to actually fit in and be successful here. It was very challenging. I and mean, in the end, I think a lot of the Asians um, that I saw, um, South Asians and Asians here, they, there are a lot of them coming in from the bottom ranks, but after time, uh, they tend to leave. And I think one of the main challenges is that you feel after a while that you actually have given up a part of you just to be successful in that culture. And over time, um, they don't get to, they don't have people that move up through those ranks because it is a kind of difficult environment and you feel like you gave up something along the way. So many of us already suspected that Wall Street is involved in inappropriate work practices. Um, so how, what can we do to uh, bring about changes where uh, some of the things that I read in your book were quite shocking to hear about the outrageous behavior of your coworkers, the excessive spending, um, the blatant discrimination towards women and minorities, and the favoritism towards people coming from the influential and powerful backgrounds. What do you think can be done to change that work culture, or if, or if anything can be done, since it's something that's so set in their system and it's been there for so long? Do you think anything can be done to change that work culture? I do, and I actually think it comes from leadership, and that's why I, my focus now is I go into companies and I teach about leadership, and I teach senior leaders about uh, self-awareness, stress management, and meditation is one of the tools we use. Um, but the one thing, the thing is, as I found consistently, is there wasn't a sense of person personal accountability amongst the leaders, and that really needs to be happened. What happens so often is that people just turn a blind eye when they see things that are inappropriate, and there really needs to, it needs to happen at a leadership level level because the culture is so hierarchical that in some organizations you can really make changes from bottom up. In this type of an organization, it's very difficult to do. So because I see that as one of the main changes that can happen, that's what I spend my time focusing on. So you focus on the senior management to kind of start from that level that because ultimately they're the ones setting the, the environment, setting the, uh, the mood of the pretty much of the, the entire work culture. Absolutely. I definitely, especially, I mean, I go into a lot of organizations that tend to be male dominated, that tend to have a hierarchical culture. And I do believe in those type of environments, you do start with the leadership because if everyone turns a blind eye and doesn't really pay attention to what goes on, condones it, you have an environment that's very difficult for anyone who's different, women, minorities, across the board, for them to really be successful. So why did you decide to write this book? Clearly, it's not a favorable representation of that banking, investment banking environment. Why did you decide to write this book? I decided to write it because, um, you know, I have been part of the diversity programs. I started a women's program there. And a lot of the attitude from some of the, the male colleagues, um, from people that are coming from this very elitist background is, well, you know what? They couldn't make it. The minorities can make it. The women can make it. And they kind of see it as, well, you know, we're just hard workers. We're just doing our job, but they couldn't make it. And what I wanted people to see is I wanted them to see that it's not that the women, minorities, the other person couldn't make it. It's that the environment that we're walking into is one where we have to actually give up quite a bit of things that 
make us happy, and that could be challenging. So this isn't just about hard work, and it's very hard for people to see um, see what they're not going through, right? These people aren't experiencing it. They don't realize what it is to give up different parts of yourself. So I wanted that awareness to be there because I think that's how you actually do help make change. They have no awareness of it. So there are many young South Asian professional women out there who can very easily relate to your experience. A lot of them are part of big law firms, which tend to have a very similar work culture as the investment banking environment. What advice would you give to these women to not only um, survive in that environment, but also succeed with their careers um, in that particular you know, high pressure environment? One of the things, so I didn't feel like I went to business. I went into business school. I didn't feel the one area I didn't feel prepared in is I didn't know that you'd have to go. I didn't know so much of my time would be spent navigating the corporate culture. I thought you know I'd be challenged with the spreadsheets, with the conversation, the intellectual dialogue. That's not where I was challenged. This is where I was challenged. So I actually do spend a lot of time going into business schools, helping um, women and minorities get a sense of what it is. And I think the awareness of knowing that these are the challenges you're going to face, and they'll probably be more challenging than your job, is helpful. And and just you know, picking and choosing what you're going to give up. I felt like um, there were so many things I had to give up. But if you have a, if you're kind of pay attention to the things you have to give up, I think you have a better sense of who you are, and you don't get as lost. I felt like I got very lost in that process. So a lot of the women what I speak to, they start to think, yeah, I didn't even pay attention that I was doing this and I was talking about all these things that I wasn't necessarily interested in. Um, and they start to pick and choose. It's a pick and choose what, what actually, what you're willing to give up so you don't get lost in the whole process. So just like many immigrant families where success and prestige and power is kind of defined by the profession of an individual, whether we choose to become an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer, or a business person, um, your family and the Parsi community that you were part of also played a huge role in, um, deciding, in you deciding your educational and career choices. Um, tell us about growing up in that high pressure environment and also do you think that South Asian immigrant families sometimes put too much pressure on their kids to um, pick a pre determined, predefined uh, career field where, where they wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be happy doing what they're kind of uh, asked to do. Pretty much. Yeah, so I think it's a mixed bag. On one hand, it's fantastic that they have such high standards for their children. Um, you know, I can compare it to some of my American friends who never even had expectations for their kids to go to college, and they didn't go to college. So I'm very grateful that we had that grounding, but at the same time, it doesn't have to be incredibly rigid that you have three career choices, and if you don't go with that, we're, you know, we're not keeping a relationship with you. That's extreme. I think there's a nice balance. One of the things I'm seeing now, and I have so many South Asians reaching out to me is um, that there's more of a balanced track that people tend to take. Of course, I see the, you know, there's the South Asian, the, you know, can't have an, one without an engineering degree, a law degree, a business. But at the same time, I think people are finding, I see it more as a calculated kind of career where they have, that might be what they spend a lot of their time doing or their full-time job, but then they have, you know, all their outside passion is in music because that's what they love to do. So what I think is interesting is I'm seeing a lot of them find the balance. They had the practical route and they're doing something they love and that's exactly what I did as well. I have a whole corporate career. I have my MBA. Um, I do my writing, but I still go into the business world. So I find the balance that works for me and I think everyone has to, you know, South Asians are going to be able to find that for themselves. So how did your family react to this book, uh, finding out about, reading about your experiences? Well, you know, as a second generation, I have to say, I feel like many of us don't tell our parents what we do or what the real experiences are like. So my parents genuinely did not know the exp what my experience was like. And I have to admit, they read it for the first time in the book, and they were quite shocked. They were quite shocked. And, um, you know, I think it took them a while to come to terms with not only learning about my experience and what it was really like, but also we have a lot of the book talks about the family story of what it's like to grow up here and feel like I'm part of two different cultures, but not fitting into anything particularly. Um, and that was a shock for them too, to have personal, they're very personal, they didn't necessarily want um, such details about the family. But at the same time, I think the reaction has been um, pretty reassuring to them because we're finding, and I, and I kind of had a sense of this, so many people can relate to the story. I mean, I have so many people that reach out and say, I feel like this is my autobiography. You know, if people that are not South Asian, they're not even women. So it's interesting. Um, it's such a relatable story. And my parents have seen that as people approach them. So I think they're much more comfortable with it. But definitely the initial shock was there. So thank you so much for joining us today. Not only are you a uh, motivation to, motiv to the South Asian community, but also uh, women in general. 
for being able to succeed under extreme circumstances and also having the strength to tell us your story so that you can motivate and educate the next small town girl from Texas <laughs> on, you know, on her way to Wall Street. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us today thank and you. wish you continued success. Thank you. Thank you.